Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here, and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. Today's video has been kindly sponsored by Squarespace, we're going to discuss more about that later on, but we will be previewing Game Week 24 today. If you're enjoying the content on this channel, please do remember to like, comment, and subscribe, but without further ado, let's jump into it. So guys, in case you missed it, I did release a video on Sunday evening where I spoke about all of the upcoming blanks and doubles. So it's over 20 minutes long, a complete guide to try and help you navigate through the upcoming blanks and doubles. But there were quite a few questions around what to do if I've already used one of my free hit or wild card or both, or potentially you've still got your chips, but you're not planning on playing them before kind of game week 29, and you're actually going to save most of them for the back end of the season, that sort of final 10 game weeks. So what I thought I'd discuss quickly here is if you've not got any chips or you're not planning on using them, how do you navigate the upcoming game weeks with just your transfers? So this is what was partially discussed in the video. We've got double blank game week 25, which is four teams blanking, four teams doubling. We have double game week 27 with four teams doubling. We've then got the biggest blank game week of the season in game week 28, which is likely to be 10 teams blanking. And then we have double game week 29, which is likely to have 10 plus teams doubling. To make that even more tricky, a lot of the teams that blank in 28 will have that blank fixture rearranged for 29. So a lot of the teams that blank in 28 will double in game week 29. And unfortunately, we won't find out double game week 29 until around game week 27, 28. So it could be tricky even with chips to try and navigate all of this. But let's say you don't have any chips or you don't want to use them. What should be your strategy? So I think at the moment, the best thing to do is to bring in players from teams that we know will definitely not be blanking and have the most fixtures projected from game week 24 to game week 29. So what you can see here on your screen is the number of fixtures is that first number. And then in brackets, that is the amount of blank game weeks we are predicting that team to have. All of the teams that have zero blank game weeks, zero in the brackets, we know for certain they will not be blanking unless something random happens. So Arsenal, Chelsea, Villa, Palace, Forest, and Everton are the teams that will not have a blank between Game Week 24 and Game Week 29. So if your team's maybe looking a little bit tricky for 25 and looking ahead to 28 after watching my video, go back and watch it if you haven't already. You're maybe thinking 28 might be difficult to navigate. I don't have a free hit. Bringing in players from those teams there that will not have a blank game week up to game week 29 is probably a good idea. And teams like Everton, we know also won't have a blank game week in game week 32 either, which is the second blank game week. So it may well be that you just want to bring in Everton players because you know they will see you through right up until the end of the season, probably. Not necessarily that you want to load up on them, but at least they won't be blanking. So the rest of them, there are estimations based on if we think they might blank in 28. And then if they blank in 28, obviously they have a very good chance of doubling in 29. But for some of the teams, the fixture in 28 won't move to game week 29. I won't go through all of the permutations here, but this is just to give you a bit of an idea about the teams that I will be targeting. targeting. So Arsenal we've spoke about for a while, but most of us probably own three Arsenal. The only thing to note with Arsenal is they will not double in game week 29. So yes, they see you through the upcoming blanks. Yes, they have a double game week themselves coming up in game week 25. But it does mean that in 29, if you're not planning on using a free hit, you will have three players that only have a single week. Chelsea are another team that look pretty good. They've got a fixture in 25 and a fixture in 28. Could bring in the likes of Jao Felix, as we'll discuss a bit later. And then there are some teams that maybe you don't want to load up on loads of players, but Aston Villa, Palace, Forest, and Everton, they will serve you fine. The likes of a Mings, a Tarkovsky, the likes of a Brennan Johnson, or I don't know, someone from Crystal Palace that you might want to bring in. Eze or an Elise, there are players that you could fill up your squad with. You don't want to load up on them, but these are the teams that if I weren't using chips or I didn't have any that I'd be loading up on. You can see Liverpool and Southampton have seven fixtures as well, but they will have a blank game week almost definitely in game week 28. So that's something, something to keep an eye on. Bournemouth have no blanks, but only six fixtures, i.e. they don't have any upcoming doubles. Then you've got City all the way down to Newcastle, as you can see by six and then brackets one. These teams have six fixtures rather than seven, and they are almost definitely going to blank in one. However, like the likes of Leeds and Fulham, they can't both blank in game week 28. We need to wait for that information. This is why it's maybe not, doesn't make too much sense to bring in teams that we think could have a blank game week. This is why all the teams from where it says Arsenal to Everton, it probably makes more sense to load up on these players until we have more information. You can see Brentford and Brighton have six fixtures, but they have two blanks. They also have two double game weeks, one in 27 and then probably one in 29 if they do blank in 28. So that's just to say Brentford and Brighton are two teams that will have two double game weeks, which is great, but also you're going to have to try and find things to do with them in game week 25 
and game week 28. And then Manchester United are the only team with five fixtures and two blanks. So maybe Manchester United players aren't essential at the moment. And I would start maybe looking to bring some of them out of your team. So hopefully this is helpful. I'm deliberately not going into too much detail of this. I've already released a video earlier in the week discussing this in more detail. And also some of these things we just don't know yet. But definitely from Arsenal to Everton, those teams there, they look like teams that are worth targeting. They will not blank. Some of them have double game weeks as well. It looks like a good set of teams to target. So hopefully that's been helpful. If you've not got any chips, let me know which players you're currently planning on bringing in or if you're waiting to use your chips later in the season let me know what your current chip strategy is so this isn't just because salah scored in game week 23 but we are going to have a bit of a discussion around de bruyne versus salah are either of them going worth going for if you have de bruyne should you sell for salah we will of course discuss this going into game week 25 as well because salah has the double in 25 kdb does have bournemouth but it is bournemouth away and to be honest kdb just hasn't looked quite at it at the moment and the fixture in game week 24 on paper Yes, Nottingham Forest looks like it could be a good fixture, but actually Forest at the city ground at home have been exceptional this season. Post-World Cup, Nottingham Forest have been one of the best teams in the Premier League. They've accumulated one of the most points in game week 23 in the league. So Forest actually isn't an easy game, especially, like I said, if it's an away fixture at the city ground. Yes, Salah's fixture isn't much better, right? It's away at St. James's Park. It's against Newcastle. It's not a much better fixture. But people are talking about, do you just get it done this week? Salah's data... We'll discuss in a second. Some people are saying potentially better. He's more of a goal threat. Get Salah in place and then have him for the double game week. Now, it feels weird saying this because both De Bruyne and Salah have been pretty rubbish. And I know a lot of people will still be sat there even after the goal in 23. Even if I make a compelling case to go for Salah, a lot of people will still be sat there thinking, no, I don't want to go for Salah. I don't want to go for Darwin. Liverpool aren't great, which is absolutely fine. But they've now won in 23. I guarantee if they put up any kind of performance in game week 24 where they get a couple of goals or keep a clean sheet or do anything against Newcastle, people will be clamoring to get them in for game week 25. So let's have a bit of a discussion around De Bruyne and Salah. The fixtures in general, I would say are relatively similar, but of course Liverpool have the extra fixture in game week 25. For game week 28, Man City are more likely than Liverpool to blank, but I am predicting that both teams have a good chance of blanking. I think Liverpool are around a 50% chance. It depends on the Fulham versus Leeds game. And then Man City are about a 92% chance. So let's say pretty much confirmed City will be blanking in 28. There is a small chance that Liverpool play in 28. If they do play in 28, then they will have two extra fixtures across the next five game weeks in comparison to Man City. Of course, you don't have to make this move in game week 24, though. You could wait until game week 25. But let's look at the statistics post-World Cup from 17 to 23. These statistics do not incorporate Salah's stats from game week 23 because at the time of recording, the stats still haven't updated with Salah's game from game week 23. He did perform very well. He accumulated a, a quite a high XG. So that would probably boost his stats up slightly. But of course, I can't wait to record this. So I don't have his game week 23 stats here. But minutes per game-wise... De Bruyne is a minutes risk at the moment. And the thing that we love about Salah is he's never a minutes risk. And even, I don't want to speak too soon, but even with all of the Liverpool attackers back, I would be very surprised to see Salah benched. And if he does come off early, it tends to still be like 80, 85 minutes. You can see here, he's played 90 minutes in pretty much every game this season. Post-World Cup, he has played 90 minutes in every single game. He's just very, very nailed. So that's what we like about Salah. De Bruyne has always been a slight rotation risk, but specifically lately... I like that. I see the fact that Pep likes to play the two up front against the three back where Alvarez and Haaland play alongside each other. I think other people can play the De Bruyne role, especially when he's not performing to the extent that we've seen previously. So that's the first thing to note. Regardless of the statistics, Salah is not a rotation risk. De Bruyne is, and Salah has the extra fixture. FPL points wise, they've both been really disappointing. And this is really, really disappointing for two premiums. 3.23 points per 90 for, for De Bruyne and 3.83 per 90 for Salah. That's terrible. You wouldn't, you'd want more than that from like a 5 million pound asset. So their actual output has been really bad. But as you can see here, they are both underperforming their expected FPL points. So De Bruyne is actually coming out on top at 5.21 expected FPL points, Salah at 5.04. That's still not great. But if they were actually putting up those FPL points and getting those kind of returns, it would be the equivalent of roughly an assist every game, or maybe like a goal and some bonus points every two games. That would be starting to get towards what you would expect from a premium. But still, we're not that impressed. And when you look at their non-penalty expected goal involvement, again, it paints a picture of two assets that haven't been creating the amount of chances they usually would and getting the amount of chances they usually would. And the thing that really bothers me about these stats is actually De Bruyne's non-penalty expected goals, which we've spoken about across the season, but specifically post-World Cup. His non-penalty expected goals is 0.12. That's really bad. That's like between like eight and nine matches. Every eight or nine matches, he'll accumulate an expected goal. 
It's just not very good. And I think with a premium asset, yes, we can see his expected assist very high, but you need them to be a goal threat too. So whilst his expected goal involvement is 0.64, so much is made up through expected assists that even if he picks up an assist or two, if he, it will sometimes get bonus points for that, but he won't always do so. So you're probably looking at, he's got quite a low ceiling at the moment based on these stats. Maybe a couple of assists, not very likely to pick you up a goal. And I want more for 12.4, especially when there are no upcoming doubles for Man City. They're likely to blank in 28 as well. I'm thinking it probably is the time to sell De Bruyne. Maybe not necessarily this week, but I won't be holding on to long term looking at these stats. Now, the issue with Cot is that Salahs aren't much better. He's got better non-penalty expected goals, but still much lower than what you'd expect from Salah at 0.29. In the past, we're looking at about a 0.4 to 0.5 non-penalty expected goals for Salah, but his expected assists are actually pretty good still. And this is maintained across what you would expect from Salah in re recent seasons, which is about a 0.3 expected assist. So that actually puts Salah's non-penalty expected goal involvement lower than De Bruyne's. But I feel like it's a healthier mix. It's about a split, equal split between expected goals and expected assists. He's a little bit more of a goal threat. And Salah is on penalties. Now, I don't think Liverpool have had a single penalty in the Premier League this season. But I wouldn't let that affect you moving forward. Let's, let's be reasonable. They should, at some point, get a penalty. And Salah will take that penalty. So that is an added bonus too. And I just feel like, generally speaking, Salah is the greater goal threat. And that is what leans me in favor of him, especially when you get an extra fixture. Touches in the box. De Bruyne is getting what you would normally expect with him, to be honest. He doesn't get that many at 3.87 per 90. Salah's has dropped slightly from his season average and what you'd expect for Salah to 7.67. But that's still really good. And I think generally when I look at these stats, I'm not, I'm not too displeased by either. It just worries me the lack of goal set from De Bruyne. And I just feel like Salah's expected goals, again, I'd like to see that a little bit higher. When I'm looking at am I going to make the switch, I will almost definitely be making the switch from De Bruyne to Salah for Game Week 25. A lot of people will probably be commenting, what about Mares? Why don't you just go from De Bruyne to Mares? You're still getting a City asset against Bournemouth away, but you're saving like 4.7 million. Mares is still a rotation risk. I know a lot of people say he isn't, but he is still a rotation risk. He can come off early. He's not going to start every game. And the Champions League is starting back up again soon as well. And I think that Pep will be prioritizing the Champions League. I, that's not to say that I don't think he will prioritize the league as well, but I really think he wants to win that Champions League. And Mares is in his best 11 at the moment. So if Mares is going to start in the Champions League, does that leave the spot open for someone like Bernardo Silva or Foden's playing the right? Or maybe Trey Alvarez out there in the Premier League? I, could, I am just hypothesizing, I don't know, but I think with the Champions League coming back, with the lack of extra fixtures for Man City, with the possible blank in game at 28, I would prefer to move to other assets, specifically someone like Salah. I know he hasn't been performing very well, but all it takes is a couple of goals, regain the confidence, and you don't even necessarily need him to be worth the money. You just, unless you feel like you can use the money elsewhere, because I think if I did De Bruyne to Mahrez, I don't look at my team and think, well, that's great. I can use that money to do X, Y, Z. I just think, well, I could use the money if I wanted to, but I don't really need it. And so really De Bruyne to Salah feels like a, a relatively straightforward move for me. So I'll leave it there. Let me know down below in the comments, are you currently planning on bringing in Salah or are you not convinced by the Liverpool attack still? I just think that's a really nice double against Crystal Palace and Wolves. Decent fixtures after that. I think I'll be making the move, but probably in game at 25. So there were a lot of questions around some of the forwards, specific questions about specific players, but also just the forwards in general. So here are some of the forwards that I would maybe be considering. Not everyone on this list, I think, is a great option. We'll discuss most of them here right now. But really, for me, it depends on what you need from that forward. Do you need them to play every single game? I, are you planning on playing a free hit in 25 or 28? If you're not, you, you probably need a player that plays in 25 or 28. Or if you're not wildcarding in 27 as well. If you feel like you need the players to cover the blanks, well, then that makes it a lot easier because you will only bring in a player that is going to cover you for both, both blanks, which is the likes of Brennan Johnson, and Ketia, Watkins, Felix, and Havertz. The rest of them are likely to have at least one blank game week. So that would suddenly change it. Do you need a cheaper forward? Is it someone that can rotate? Maybe you've got a Matoma and you need someone to play in the weeks that Matoma blanks. Well, then that changes it as well. So it really depends on what you need. But here are some of the options that I don't mind. You've got Nyonto and Cunha as the cheaper and also, I guess, Brennan Johnson as those below 6 million. I do still think Nyonto's a decent option. He's likely to blank in game week 28, but that's not necessarily a massive issue. A lot of players will be, some people will be free hitting. His data is okay. For 5 million, 0.38 non-penalty expected goal involvement is fine. He looks nailed at the moment and he's passing the eye test too. So as an option, I really don't mind Nyonto. I'm not entirely convinced by Cunha. The reason for that is that he's not completely nailed. He does come off early when he starts. And from what we've seen, it's only 252 minutes, hence the asterisk. But he's only got 0.18 non-penalty expected goal involvement. So for me, whilst he does double in 25, and while some people seem to think he's nailed to start on pretty much every game, 
I think there are potentially better options. And for me, I wouldn't personally be considering him. Actually, my, my favorite cheaper striker is probably Brennan Johnson. Again, Forrest don't blank in 25 or 28. He's got 0.57 non-penalty expected goal involvement. And as far as I know, he is on penalties as well, Brennan Johnson. Forrest have been really good post-World Cup. I actually think he's a really decent shout if you do need a cheaper striker. You've then got Ian Acho who, as you can see here, 1.19 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90, but he's only played 222 minutes post-World Cup. So it's difficult to draw anything meaningful from a sample size that small. You'd want at least kind of six, 700 minutes as a minimum, which most of these other strikers have. But I really do like Iheanacho. And every time he plays, he puts up crazy data. He scored something like 12 and 15 points in the last two game weeks. So if you expect Iheanacho to keep starting and you can cover the likely blank game week 28, I do like Iheanacho. But we always have this. I think we've had this in several times across the last few seasons. Ian Acho plays. Ian Acho looks great. Ian Acho then either gets injured or he gets dropped. So if you think he'll continue to stay fit and start, I do think he'll be one of the better options at that price. I would probably just like to see him start a few more games in a row personally. I don't feel like now is the time to probably be buying Leicester assets. Enketia is still arguably one of the best options, if not the best when we're looking at value. He's got the second highest projected points here. He's got 0.69 at non-penalty expected goal involvement. And again, Arsenal don't blank and they have an upcoming double. I just think that personally for me, I don't know if now is the time to be buying Enketia, but at the same time, Arteta seems to think that Jesus isn't quite ready. We're not even, I think he said something along the lines of we're not ready to discuss that yet about a timeline for his return. So you could have Enketia until sort of game at 26, 27. I just don't know if you'll have him right up until 28. And realistically, you probably want him for that blank game week as well. So I feel like Enketia, it's up to you whether you think Jesus is going to be back or not. That will probably dictate whether Enketia is an option. We've got Mitrovic on here. His data has dropped slightly post-World Cup, but it's still okay at 0.54 non-penalty expected goal involvement. The issue is that he's not really passing the eye test at the moment, and we still don't know if he's still on penalties. It could be Andreas, it could be Willian. Every penalty he's taken pretty much this season, and across his career, really, has been pretty shocking. So I don't mind keeping Mitrovic if you've got him. I probably wouldn't be looking to buy him, but they do have a decent fixture against Wolves in game week 25. If you are looking for an asset and you want to go for someone that's reliable for minutes, I don't mind Mitrovic. We've got Watkins on this list. He scored goals in recent weeks. Watkins just never has good data. Never. And the reason I know that is I love Watkins as a player. I've owned him, I think, in game two seasons ago. Not the season, not last season. I think it was the season before. It might have been last season. I owned him for something like 19 of the 38 game weeks. I love him as a player. I think he's excellent. I love his work rate, but his data is never good. And I always check up on it because I always consider buying him as an asset because I like him as a footballer. But 0.52 is about the best we've ever seen it with Watkins. It usually sits between 0.4 and 0.5 non-penalty expected goal involvement. So I, I don't think you're ever going to get a lot from Watkins. You might get the odd goal here and there. You might get a brace if you're lucky, but I don't feel like you'll get consistent returns. And he's, he's not really the sort of player that you can imagine hauling too often. So for me, Watkins is safe. Again, seven fixtures up to game week 29. He's not going to blank, so I don't mind him for those reasons, but I feel like he's a safe and reliable option, not much more than that. Felix is exciting. Again, he's only played 148 minutes, so a very small sample size here, not even two games worth. But from what we've seen, it's great. 1.17 non-penalty expected goal involvement. I do think he's an exciting asset. I think he's about as close as you're going to get to a nailed asset in that Chelsea team. And again, Chelsea don't blank in 25 and they don't blank in 28 and they're likely to double in 29. So for those reasons, I do like Felix. Interestingly, I would normally say Felix is a wait and see for this sort of player, but I feel like you could get ahead and just bring him in now. And I think if I were looking to bring in a striker, I would be extremely tempted by Felix. He would be one of my favorite options. As long as you accept that there is a risk associated that we've only seen 148 minutes of him. We still don't know exactly how Chelsea are going to look as an attacking unit going forward. And he's just a bit of a risk with minutes as well because we don't know if he's 100% nailed. But I do like Felix. He's the sort of pick that I like. Very high upside. In comparison to Watkins, I think Felix is the sort of player that has a very, very high ceiling, but probably a lower floor. So it's up to you sort of what you're looking for from your striker. I've got Tony on here. Of course, Brentford blank in two of the upcoming game weeks. Not guaranteed in 28. Guaranteed to blank in 25. Potential blank in 28. But they do have a double game week in 27. And they're likely to double in 29. So it really depends when you need Tony. He is pushing that yellow card boundary once again for 10 yellow cards. So do keep an eye on that. I do like Tony as an option. Though. And as you can see here, 0.71 non-penalty expected guard is better than Nketiah. One of the best on this list. For nailed strikers... It is the best on this list. The rest of them have sort of unlimited minutes. We've got Darwin, which we'll discuss in a second. But Tony's stats are really good. He's on penalties. He's nailed. 
I think there are definitely worse options. And if you own him, I wouldn't be selling him until 25. And if you can bench him, I'd probably keep him through to game week 27. We've got Havertz as well as sort of the final cheaper asset. I think that Havertz is fine. He might be more nailed than Felix, but his conversion rate has been very, very poor this season. And I also just think that Felix has the higher ceiling from what we've seen so far. Havertz has been dropping a little bit in the 148 minutes that we've seen, which is limited. Havertz has dropped a little bit deeper and Felix is making those runs sort of bombing into the box. So I actually feel like Felix could be the more exciting pick and the guy, the guy with a higher ceiling moving forward. But I don't mind Havertz. Havertz could still be on penalties as well, which would be interesting for Chelsea. So... Either Chelsea boy, I don't mind, but I would lean Felix. And then we've got Darwin and Kane, the two sort of premium-ish strikers. Darwin's only 8.7. And as you can see here, Darwin has the best data on this table. And he actually has the second best data in the Premier League this season, only beaten by Haaland. So Darwin's data is always good. The issue we have with him is conversion. But the thing I like about Darwin is his actual, his assist threat has been very good this year, as well as his expected goals. And we saw that again in game week 23 when he provided for Salah. I think Darwin's the real deal. And I know people laugh at that. And I know there's been a bit of banter on the channel around me always loving Darwin and wanting to pick him. When you put up 1.25 expected goal involvement and he puts up consistently above one expected goal involvement every game. If he doesn't finish all of his chances, hopefully the players that he passes to will. And he will eventually finish some of these chances. And even if he doesn't finish all of them, he'll still probably get you more goals than someone with like a 0.5 expected goal involvement. So for me... And Darwin is a serious option. I am looking at both Darwin and Salah in 25. I know people will hate that. But when I look at these numbers, and this is the way I play, analytically looking at the numbers, I can't ignore Darwin. The data is so good. Projected points 40, 1.25, non-penalty expected goal involvement. And then the final asset is Kane. I've been saying this all season. His data's average. Okay, 0.66, non-penalty expected goal involvement. Very, very similar to what we saw from KDB and Salah. He's He's got okay data, but he finishes everything. And I suppose that's the difference between Darwin and Kane. Kane's got pretty much half of the, the expected data that Darwin has, but Kane finishes everything he gets offered and he's on penalties as well. So yes, Kane is, and as you can see here, 720 minutes. He's played every possible minute for Spurs post-World Cup. Kane is an excellent, excellent asset. He will continue to be so. I have no issues with you going for Kane. The issue that we've got is that they don't have any doubles and he's likely to blank in 28. So as long as you're happy having Kane for no doubles when Salah has a double and also potentially having him for the blank in 28, I don't mind him. But for me, when I'm looking at this list here, the way that I play, high ceiling, high upside, I'm looking at Darwin and Felix are the two players that really excite me here. If you want a safer option, the likes of Watkins, Tony and Mitrovic are fine, but you really need to think about which weeks do you need the striker? Because if you don't need him in a certain week, but you need him in another, that might rule out some of the players on this list. So have a sit down, look at the fixtures, pick your striker. I'm almost definitely looking at bringing in Darwin in game week 25 and Felix may wake his way into my team very, very soon. So just to finish up, there are a few questions around, do we still continue to keep and play Haaland? Do we continue to captain Haaland? At the time of me recording this, I've not got an update on his little injury that he had in the first game of game week 23. As far as I'm concerned, I think he's fine, but I'm just going to discuss Haaland in general. And if he is injured long term, then of course this is nonsense and you can click off. But I think it is interesting to talk about because there has been a drop off, as we'll discuss in a second. He didn't take the penalty in 23, which was interesting. We don't yet know if that was because Mares maybe had dibs on that game or potentially Haaland already felt the injury that he came off with and didn't want to risk it because Haaland is a goal scorer. And I find it surprising that he didn't just take the ball and take the penalty, regardless of what was planned. And then after the game, Pep Guardiola confirmed that Mares was second choice and Haaland was first choice as a penalty taker. So Guardiola didn't understand why Mares took it either. So I think Haaland's on penalties moving forward, but that is interesting. And if there is a drop-off as well, maybe there is something to be said. And the fact that City don't have any upcoming doubles, I do think there are other captaincy options almost every week. For example, in game week 27, I probably won't captain Haaland. In game week 25, I definitely won't be captain Haaland. In game week 29, if he doubles, then I probably will. But I think there is, there's no need now to be scared of not captain Haaland when other players have a double. But in single weeks, I still think he's the best asset in FPL. And most weeks, I'll still be captain him. As you can see by the data, which we'll talk about in a second, it's still really strong. Fixtures-wise, we spoke about them already with KDB. Just to note that if they do blank in 28, it's likely that that West Ham at home game will move into game week 29. So City would have a double of Liverpool at home and West Ham at home, and they would blank in 28. That's not 100% confirmed, but that's likely where that would fixture would go. So decent fixtures, likely to have a double in 29 because they are probably going to blank in 28. And the fixtures around that are fine. 
So looking at the data across the season versus post World Cup, as you can see the two columns there, minutes per appearance around 80 minutes. He does come off early sometimes, but generally he's going to get 80 plus minutes, which is good. That's what we want from a premium. Expected FPL points have dropped off from 8.47 to 7.39. But as when we discussed Salah and De Bruyne, they were around five expected FPL points. You can see Haaland is still in a league of his own as an FPL asset and as a premium. And there aren't many assets that can compete with him. Non-penalty expected goals, very similar. 0 0.83 across the season, 0 0.79 post-World Cup. So his goal threat hasn't really changed post-World Cup. Is maintaining a very elite level. Like I said, De Bruyne's is 0 0.12. Salah's is 0 0.29. Haaland's is 0 0.79. So it's ridiculously good. It's not going to change. He'll continue to get chances to score goals. What has dropped slightly is his expected assist has dropped from 0 0.36 across the entire season to 0 0.22 post-World Cup. So there is a little bit of a drop-off post-World Cup. He's not creating as many opportunities for his teammates. Whether that's because Mahrez is starting more and maybe Mahrez hogs the opportunities and the link-up between Haaland and Mahrez isn't good. Maybe the link-up between Haaland and Foden was slightly better. I don't know the reason for it. Maybe it's just circumstantial, but 0.22 is a bit of a drop-off. That does still put his non-penalty expected goal involvement above one. And if he is still on penalties as well, that's still elite data. And the difference between him and Darwin or him and Ian Acho or him and Felix is he will finish almost every chance he gets. So I would back Haaland to continue to perform well. Touches in the box and shots in the box have both dropped off slightly, but still highly impressive. Almost three shots in the box per 90, almost six touches in the box per 90. That means that every other touch is a shot. So I'm not going to talk about him in too much detail. This is just to say I wouldn't have any plans on selling Haaland unless there is a long-term injury. I don't think there's any need to panic. But yes, in a, in a week when he doesn't double, we'll definitely captain someone else. And in single weeks, if there is a player that you really fancy ahead of him, for example, in game at 26, there isn't a double at the moment. If you don't fancy Haaland against Newcastle, by all means, look to someone else. But I would be looking at someone else that has a similar ceiling. Someone like a Felix and a Darwin that we know can put up decent data. There's no point for me captaining someone that's got significantly worse data than Haaland just because Haaland hasn't been scoring the amount of goals that he did at the start of the season. Like, he just got a hat-trick against Wolves a couple of weeks ago. We know what he can do. Yes, he's maybe not maintaining what we saw at the start, but that doesn't mean that his data still isn't great and that we don't still expect him to convert. So... I'm not panicking about Haaland. I think he's absolutely fine to keep. You can see by his touch map, he's perfect as an FPL asset. So yeah, don't panic. Continue to captain most of the time in single weeks. If other teams have doubles captain them then, let me know down below what you think of Haaland. And if you have any plans on maybe selling him anytime soon. So guys, there you have it. That is the Game Week 24 preview. Hopefully it was helpful for you. To be honest, I know a lot of people this week will be looking to roll the transfer and I don't necessarily blame you. Before we finish today's video, I do just want to give a massive shout out to Squarespace who have sponsored today's video. Squarespace allows you to connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated members only content. You can manage your members, send email communications and leverage audience insights all on one easy to use platform. When it comes to setting up the site, it genuinely couldn't be easier and I truly do mean that. There are tons of templates to choose from as well as videos and support messages to guide you throughout the process. One of the things that I love about Squarespace is the ability to display posts from your social profiles on your website. So you can automatically push website content to your favorite social media channels so that your followers can share it too. If you go to squarespace.com slash FPL Raptor or click the link in the description, you can get access to a 14 day free trial and save 10% on your first purchase of a website or a domain. So like I said, do check Squarespace out. Link in the description helps to support the channel. And of course, it is a fantastic product as well. If you have enjoyed today's video, please do drop a like, drop a comment down below to feed those algorithm gods also make sure to subscribe we are on the road to 70,000 subscribers but until next time thank you very much for watching cheers bye bye